It's got to be hundreds minimum, right? Oh, probably. Yeah. I think you'd have to walk into your industrial supply house with loads of self-confidence and uh, <laughs> some, some dirty work clothes on and make sure you park whatever little car you're driving far away from the windows. Welcome to the Fine Home Building Podcast, our weekly discussion of building, remodeling, and design topics aimed at anybody who cares deeply about the craft and science of working on houses. This is Senior Editor Patrick McComb. Today I'm joined by Editorial Advisor Mike Gurton. Morning. Afternoon. Operations <laughs> Operations Manager for TDS Custom Construction, Ian Schwant. Good evening. And our... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and our stick with it producer, Jeff Rose, please email your questions to fhbpodcast at ton.com. You can find previous podcasts and check out the show notes at finehomebuilding.com slash podcast. Well, if we didn't have a rocky enough start to the day, gentlemen, uh, you've made it even better. So thanks very much for that. <laughs> we stuck Folks with listening, we, Yeah, folks listening, we had some trouble using our normal recording uh, platform called Squadcast. So Squadcast, if you're listening, fix your stuff. Um <laughs> What have you guys been up to? I'll start with you, Ian. How was it getting back to work probably in the full swing this week? Oh, it was good. We had a, a lot of projects that we had teed up to sign and uh, worked from home a couple days, did some pretty sizable estimates. So it's always fun to kind of put my head down and get back into the, the spreadsheet work. <laughs> <laughs> What's so amazing to me is you're sincere when you say that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I, I wish I had like a little cave that I could go into where it was just dark, only illuminated by Google Sheets. Mike, did you like that part of the business when you were doing it? I didn't, and I still don't. It, it's, <laughs> um, it, it, what I found is it, it at the end of the day, Ian, how do you feel like that you've accomplished things. I'm so used to being in the field and it's like at the end of the day, you can look back and just see what you've done, you know, the physical, the physicalness of it. Yeah. I, I get some of that physical uh, feeling from having done the sheet and seeing how all the numbers work out and starting to see how the project is going to come together based on, uh, based on the estimate and thinking about specific parts of it. This project that I worked on yesterday has a very elaborate screen porch that is going to take a we we call it finish framing, where you're you're going to have to pretty much frame everything perfect to be able to execute the finishes. So that was uh, a challenge to think through, and we've been talking a lot about it uh, between the three uh, project managers and I and the architect at work about how best to to design it. Uh, so the when I hear, the... uh, sorry to interrupt you, Ian, when I hear porches, I think pressure treated lumber and you just mentioned the precision with which you have to frame this. How the heck's that work? So we're going to frame the entire roof system out of LSL lumber. And from the outside, the screen porch will have a, a gable roof to match the rest of the house, but inside the screen porch, it will be a, a hip roof. So it'll look like a, a pyramid, which will then be finished in uh, clear vertical grain dug for beadboard, which wow, we're going to have to, to miter around the ceiling. You know, what I find interesting is I think of it as in terms of the satisfaction I get from building something physically. You've built the spreadsheet, but you've also built the entire project in your mind. You right. value engineered it. So there is a lot of, you yep. know, satisfaction in that level, too. Yeah. And I had a good time yesterday working at home and I could, you know, get to a point and then go throw the ball for the dogs outside for 10 or 15 minutes and clear my mind and then come back and you, you pick up on different things when you walk away from it like that. Well, uh, you know, that's where the rubber meets the road in the contracting business. So, uh, you know, they should be happy that you're into it and do a good job. Do you ever just like yeah. completely space something and forget it? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I'm, <laughs> I'm known for forgetting to put in doorknobs uh, for some reason. So I, I've added a different line to my spreadsheet to automatically include a, a base quantity of doorknobs per doors that I interact with on the sheet. Because I think I had three in a row where I just didn't put them in. 
That's hilarious. <laughs> Jeff, what have you work, been up to? Oh, go ahead. Those, those mental workarounds that you have to do to cue yourself so you don't forget things. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Jeff, what have you been up to? I bet you've been cleaning up leaves. That's about it. Yeah. Visiting with family and cleaning leaves. What's your go-to method for uh, leaf uh, management? Well, since they're still falling, I'm just mulching with the lawn tractor. And at a point, they blow away anyway, right? Um. Yeah. Yeah. Or blow into my yard from the neighbors, one or the other. So. <laughs> I thought Mike, you were going to say your go-to method was to pick up the phone and call somebody to deal with your leaves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's the rest uh, of the neighbors. Is. Almost a year ago, the company Ego sent me one of their battery-powered backpack blowers, and uh, it's pretty great. Um, it's there's really no downside. Uh, to it it doesn't have as much horsepower as a gas pro model but for you know uh, a homeowner like myself it works just fine and uh, it's you don't really need hearing hearing protection when you use it and it's lasts long enough to do my you know half acre of you know mowed lawn and works just fantastic which brings me to the subject of our after show i'm going to plug it now um we're going to talk about um Fall maintenance, what that means to us and how we're getting ready for houses. I especially want to talk to Mike what it's like getting several houses ready for a winter who have people living in them. But uh, I'm going to say, Mike, you and I had a pretty interesting weekend. Do you want to tell folks what we were doing? Yeah, so we were at the Touch a Trade event in Kent, Connecticut that uh, you had mentioned a couple of times on the podcast. And you had Mason Lord on talking about it a couple months ago on Pro Talk. And it was just, uh, I'm still, uh, I'm still on a high and it's been yeah. a, almost a week. Yeah. What was your takeaway? Can you, well, can you explain to so, folks what it was? Um, yes. First? So the touch, the touch of trade event was an event that was um, put on by a bunch of construction pros who wanted to encourage young people to consider the trades as a, as a trade, as a career path, but rather than waiting until their high school, try to uh, reach them when they're younger. You know, uh, the, the target audience was middle school, probably like that 10 to 12 range. And uh, it was centered in Connecticut. So it's a Hudson Valley, Western, Northwestern Connecticut. And so they drew from that region. Um, and we had construction trade, uh, trade craft, People, uh, all sorts of people, I had Andy Steele, who's been on the podcast before, uh, some folks from Hudson Valley Preservation, um, which is Mason Lord's company that that sort of initiated and sponsored it, and then a whole bunch of interesting uh, tradecraft folks doing little demonstration and activities that anybody of any age could participate in. And we got people from as young as infants all the way up to a couple of folks there looked like they were in their 80s. Um, so yeah, it was fun by all. An arborist, a machinist, a couple plumbers, uh, weavers, uh, people making uh, window sash and restoring furniture. And uh, forgive me, anyone who's listening who was there that I didn't mention, but it oh, was 20 some presenters and it was... Yeah. As you said, an inspiring uh, event, and I, I, like you said, I'm still on a high too. I saw the sheer joy in young people who had never tried some of this stuff, and you could just see it on their face how exciting it was for them, and the kindness and uh, engagement our presenter showed toward these folks was also equally moving. So, thank you all who were there. It was an amazing experience, and so, uh, I was thrilled to be a part of it. So, if you can see my virtual background here. <laughs> this was a photograph that Kevin Ireton took of young Vince here. And I think he's about six years old and he's with Addison, one of my friends. And you can just see the pleasure on his, he's just smiling ear to ear, running a reciprocating saw, just cutting off a two by four. And he must've cut about eight of them off. And that was the way the whole day went. <laughs> there were kids doing all sorts of things that they'd never touched before, getting filthy, dirty, getting joint compound on them, getting tile setting compound on them, planing uh, boards and, and cutting boards. I had it, saw an eight year old running a circular saw, cutting a, a, a rafter tail. And, and she wanted to do it again and again and again. So, thanks. 
I looked up at one point and was very surprised to see a young person climbing a tree with a belay route uh, held by an arborist. And, you know, this happened all day because you're going 20, 30 feet up in this tree. It was just, just amazing. Yeah. So we're trying to make it a model for uh, events similarly uh, throughout the country. So um, visit the website if you haven't yet to learn how it went. And uh, I hope you will get involved. And the website is? Touchatrade.org. All right, folks. Uh, so we heard from a number of our listeners on past discussions. Uh, this comes from Dave in Vermont. Ian made an interesting distinction between patience and experience. I have heard it said that the mastery of a craft means you've made every mistake at least once and presumably learned from it. But in this instance, I'm not sure how to parse the two. Patience and experience would be birds of a feather when it comes to working methodically. I see lots of folks who I know know better, but decide maybe unconsciously to skip steps to get to the part that they want to do more. What do you think? I'll ask Ian first. What do you think, Ian? <laughs> I think he's talking about working methodically, and uh, Mike can probably attest to this, but not everybody with a lot of experience has the patience to work methodically. Uh, I've worked with a worked with a lot of very experienced individuals who, you know, had the the messiest job sites, the most disorganized trucks, but you know, could still crank out high quality work. I would consider those to be people who didn't didn't really have the patience for it, but still still did the job in the end. What do you think, Mike? Well, I, I, I well, Dave makes an excellent point, and I think that uh, patience and experience do go hand in hand. One of uh, Dave's observations leads me to think of the way a lot of us cut corners. A lot of times, you know, you get used to doing things over and over again, and you think, well. You know, it takes me a long time to do it this way. Maybe I can save a little here, save a little there, because there is a price pressure when we're doing things, and time is money. Um, so uh, a lot of times, I'm, I'm guilty of it myself. I can think of a couple of instances where, it, think of cutting a corner, putting on house wrap, and bridging that inside corner where a, two walls meet at a 90-degree angle, and then something punctures that house wrap and now a leak gets in there and it was all because you just didn't spend that time and be real conscientious about what you're doing at every step to talk it really in there so it doesn't get messed up yeah right yeah it seems like you always regret taking shortcuts or at least i do uh you know that seldom is the shortcut payoff more than the additional labor to fix whatever it is you screwed up because of it and a lot of times the people who do the screwing up or cut the corner or shortcut things, they don't ever experience the downside, bad or ill effects. Um, some of those things will say, say bridging the corner with the house wrap and then puncturing it and then getting a leak in that corner. It could be 20 years later that some homeowner then it's discovered when a painter is going to paint and they're seeing that all the trim is beginning to decay from the backside because the water got behind it or whatever. And then, um, yeah, if somebody pays the price, I guess, is the, the point there. Jeff, have you ever cut a corner and regretted it? All the time. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about like dovetail making as an example. You've been, oh. uh, you know what I mean? Like there are no corners to cut in dovetails, except they're all corners. <laughs> <laughs> I think it, it should be said though, that when you're working as a, as an experienced individual, you do over time develop some efficiencies that I think can be mistaken as impatience by somebody who, who is not working at your level. Yeah, the people we all make fun of for being too slow, right? Uh, the the, the trades we 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 know trades people who are fast at their jobs and others who are slow. Yeah. This uh, Josh wrote in uh, a while back about how they prepare foundations for um, building on in the winter time in uh, South Dakota. And we made the observation that it must be pretty dry there because if you had standing water in the foundation hole, it would be a, a risk to the poured concrete. Uh, he says, uh, hey folks, South Dakota ha has, can have wet spring, summers and falls. With that said, we have cold and dry winters. Our snow crunches. Even Minnesota visitors in winter mention how dry it is. So for us, once the footings and foundations are done, there's very little liquid water until we thaw out. 
When it does, we pump out and dehumidify. I have had to shovel out many a foundation full of snow, though. <laughs> P.S. Gravel and P.E. Gravel is uh, rough graded and backfilled in and around as well. So Josh is taking the right precautions, right? Uh, we were also talking about cleaning band joists and uh, nearby joists for air sealing work, right? That's one of the leakiest parts of most homes and, uh, you know, most weatherization efforts or uh, air sealing efforts focus on that as one of the early things you do. And uh, we were talking about a number of different ways to clean this stuff so that any sealing materials you put on there would stick. And I happened to run into Dan Colbert at Touch a Trade. And he said that uh, soda blasting is the way to do this. And I, I'm unfamiliar with soda blasting, but I've heard about it. Do you guys uh, ever use this? No. No. So apparently it doesn't make a big mess, uh, contrary to what you might imagine. Is What is the thing that you're blasting? What is the material? Is that the same as CO2, for, uh, uh, dry ice blasting? I think it's baking soda is the medium, and I think it's uh, compressed air. I don't know if it's CO2 as the you know air source, but... Because we've used, for, for mold mitigation, uh, we've used uh, dry ice, and we just blast that against the surface. And it's, you know, solid, but then when it, it all of a sudden just... Um, it, it you want the word? Sublimates <laughs> right into the atmosphere. <laughs> And that way there's no cleanup. Um, I, I, I haven't heard of soda blasting. That must look completely awesome, Mike. <laughs> it does. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one of the um, one of the guys doing the work, he said, hey, you want to try this? You know, it's like a little kid, you know, <laughs> get to try a new tool. And We just... need that at Touch a Trade next year, right? <laughs> yeah. I wonder what that does for global warming, though, shooting dry ice into the atmosphere. <laughs> oh, man, I never thought of that. See, you ruin everything. Um, <laughs> This comes from Steve. Uh, Hi, I'm a home builder interested in having windows frame flush to the ceiling drywall and with floor system integrated headers. I really like the aesthetic, but what are the structural considerations for doing this? I know Mike covered this previously in a 2014 Q&A, but any insider detail would be appreciated. Thanks, I love the podcast, Steve. Well, Mike, I'll let you go first and see <laughs> what was the Q&A. <laughs> I, you know, I... I've written so many things for home building, I don't even remember, uh, but that's okay. Uh, there are a couple of ways that you can frame rough openings that would be clear all the way up to the ceiling. The easiest is if you have a non-bearing exterior wall, like on a gable end where it's non-bearing. And in that case, you don't need any headers in that wall at all. And the code has provisions for that up to eight feet wide. So in a non-bearing exterior wall, now, there's got to be some implications if you're in a seismic zone or a high wind zone. Of course, those are going to stand the most important thing. But you can go with a wide opening right up to the ceiling, no restrictions on a, on a non-bearing wall. Um, on a bearing wall, what you can do is insert the header in the floor framing above if there is a floor above. Um, and in that case, that's called an in-floor header. And the code, I think, starting in the 2015 IRC, has some prescriptive methods for doing that. The rim joist itself can serve as the header if a single, say, a 2 by 10 or 2 by 12 or whatever the floor system happens to be, or even some engineered rim board could be the header. And if you need a wider opening than the, uh, the width of the header, that, that you could use for a single rim joist, you can add an extra layer in there. And then you would hang your, your joist off that. If you're into the roof system, then it gets complicated. If your roof system and you want to have uh, is, is above that floor where you want to have that ceiling uh, height window, then in that case, you're going to have to frame the header in at the um, edge of the, the wall. Uh, it could work perfectly fine if you're using uh, like trusses, like a raised heel truss, an energy efficient truss where you can put in an LVL and then hang the those trusses off of that. When you get into stick framing, it's going to be dependent on your height above plate, so it can get a little bit complicated, but there are ways to do it. Um, one of the most innovative ways I saw, and this was a long, long time ago, 24 on center framing, um, where the windows, the the, the uh, 
the architect had designed it so the windows were 22 and a half inches wide or 22 inches wide. So they were between each of the studs. In that case, it didn't really matter. I love that idea. This, I love the, the simplicity of that. You just stick the windows in the ex holes that are there, they're there already. Yep. And then I there, think we, one, one are, of the worries is um, shear, right? We need to have enough uh, braced wall line to you know deal with these big openings too. And that's a whole other consideration based on wind and seismic values. And yep. I'm guessing you do this a lot, Ian, in your company. With the uh, burying the headers in the floor system? Yeah, that or just dealing with really tall openings that, you know, would prevent a normal header above, uh, you know, a big window or door per se. With most of the remodels that we do being on turn of the century homes, we, we don't run into that very often, but we do oftentimes, and I did it on my house too, I think based on Mike's article, uh, buried LVLs in the, the floor system to carry the basement windows as the, the headers on that bearing wall it's an efficient way to go for yeah uh, yeah and you don't you know you don't have any framing around these basement windows am i am i right right yeah uh and if those things don't work there's always steel right we can uh you know do all kinds of things with steel we can't do with wood for big openings yeah one thing i would add is that the uh, manufacturer's install guide that comes with a lot of the engineered wood products will have many of these prescriptive systems drawn out and, and specced. With load tables. Yeah. With load tables. And uh, as long as you keep that book around any inspector, you can just hand that to and that should suffice. And we did um, a couple... We did a couple articles in Fine Home Building talking about these um, wide or, or putting headers and floors and so on. And we'll have a couple links in the show notes for those to follow up. It's in addition to the Q&A that, that Steve mentioned. Yeah, we'll put those on the podcast page. Those are, those are good pieces and there's good reasons to do this in many instances. Uh, our next uh, question comes from Doug. Hi, FHB crew. I'm getting, gearing up to hire a contractor to apply three inches of closed cell spray foam inside the rubble foundation of my 1850s farmhouse. I'm curious to hear your opinion on how some of the prep work I'm considering doing first and whether you think it's necessary. I'm in upstate New York climate zone five. First, I'm thinking about installing four inch thick panels of EPS foam on the inside face of the sill beam sealed around the edges with canned spray foam. This would be more labor intensive than just having the contractor shoot the spray foam directly into the cavities. But my thought is that the uh, vapor permeability of the EPS would allow for the beam to dry to the inside, and it would also allow for easy removal for future work. Second, I'm wondering whether it's necessary to repoint the stone walls, which have very little mortar and lots of gaps. Finally, I'm wondering whether I should apply a membrane to the entire foundation wall before applying the spray foam. On this question, I'm getting conflicting advice. Both Joe Steebrook and Steve Basic use a membrane, but on GBA's community forums, a knowledgeable user advised me to apply the spray foam directly to stone to minimize air pockets where mold will grow. Both approaches seem to have their advantages, and I'm curious to know which you'd favor. Thanks so much for your help. I've been loving the podcast. Doug, who wants to go first? There's a lot to chew on with this project. I think we could do at least an hour on just this, this topic. I... Uh, yeah. So one of the reasons, one of the things we say spray foam is good for, closed cell spray foam specifically, is doing this very work. And uh, the reasons are because it is uh, vapor closed and sticks tenaciously to just about anything, and uh, works in the you know une uneven nature of a rubble foundation or fieldstone foundation. So I read the GBA post that Doug put up, and then uh, he gives it get, gets into a little bit more information and looked at the photographs that he sent in. And one of the issues that uh, st that Joe Stiebrick brings up and that Doug then followed up with further reading from both Joe and Steve regarding whether you have to have a capillary break at the top of the foundation where, the, where that timber sill sits on, because that can be a potential problem if you're getting moisture wicking up through the foundation into that, and then you put spray foam in that cavity, you can actually end up causing rot. Um, both Joe and Steve 
have over the years figured out that with these old rubble stone foundations, you're not getting a lot of wicking coming up through there. So it's not much of a concern. But then when I looked at Doug's pictures, and I don't know a lot about it, it, it looks like the rubble stone that he's talking about is different than the rubble stone that Steve and Joe encounter that we see in New England, which are granite stones with not a lot of moisture moves through granite. It looked like limestone. And I don't have any experience with limestone, but I noticed in the Joyce Bay photograph that Doug sent, it looks like water has been drawn up into the rim of that timber sill and the end of the joist. Because in that situation, the way it's framed is the joist are not bearing on the sill, the joist are bearing on the stone foundation and they're notched out. So there's a lot of dynamics going on here. And if there is moisture being wicked up through the limestone that's stacked up and into those joists and that staining leads me to believe it might be, then there's a whole lot of potential problems if we use spray foam in that location. Because it's not going to allow drying is the uh, short answer, right? Is of these the wet, wood framing members. Right. And that's one of the things that that Doug mentions is he's thinking of cutting and cobbling those four inch pieces of EPS to allow it to dry to the interior. But really what we want to do is in a situation like that is let it dry both the exterior and the interior and do everything we can to keep it from drying if moisture is going up into those joists. So ideally, and what Joe Stiebrick talks about in his first experience is jacking the house up, jacking those joists up and putting a capillary break in. And even though it's a ton of work, I almost wonder if that might be necessary for Doug to get a to be able to insulate that rim joist area or the the be that this timber sill area without having potential problem, even if he puts in the EPS, which is More somewhat vapor open. open, but it is four inches of foam. That's a lot of foam. It, you're getting down to like one perm, which though it'll migrate moisture if a lot of moisture is getting wicked up. You know, there's so many dynamics. The exterior grading is going to impact this, the amount of water coming off the roof that's draining down and then splashing back onto the building. And yeah, it's a Go ahead, line. Ian. I was going to ask, Mike, do you think this would be a better spot for mineral wool bats stuffed in that opening rather than trying to go with some kind of rigid foam? There's some advantages because you're going to, the drying is going to move right through. Um, this is where, where you'd need, I'd want to put sensors in there, at least a couple of joist bays, because a potential problem if we do put insulation in there that is of uh, uh, vapor permeable, vapor is, is open to air con convection through it, that if there's a lot of moisture in the basement, it could migrate to a cold surface like the timber uh, sill and then through the insulation and then now that timber sill is not being warmed from any uh, heat from the inside and now you get that becomes a condensing surface. These are all potential problems, but there's no way to know until you try it, and see what happens. You know, Doug, come on, this house, you know, 1850s, upstate New York, the basement is not your low-hanging fruit with regard to improving the energy performance of this house, right? Um, you know, do you need the insulation layer in the in the foundation? I mean, you're you're changing the entire characteristics of how this house has performed for a long time. And uh, the reason it's worked this so long is because it's been able to dry out. And maybe a better approach is to just do the air signaling you can with canned spray foam or tape and uh, pointing. I would definitely point the basement just because I've worked on a lot of houses with fieldstone foundations in the Pittsburgh area, which is sandstone, and they are very wet because they are very uh, porous and will take on water that's you know in the ground. And uh, boy, I would I would want some. Uh, some modeling or at least some monitoring before I went to town on this basement and changed a bunch of stuff. Some low hanging fruit for him on this type of a house of this age would be some attic air sealing and added insulation to the attic is gonna uh, give him a lot more bang for his buck than trying to do what he's describing with this basement. 
I'm betting there's, you know, thermal bypasses, uh, which Colin Russell uh, says are big holes that building scientists have figured out a fancy name for, but I'm sure there are big <laughs> holes in this house. I wonder, and Doug doesn't get into it in his question, is he wants to put the spray foam on the inside of the entire wall of the foundation. So he's not just talking about the rim joy, he's talking about insulating yeah. the foundation. And I wonder if he's planning on doing any sort of uh, creating usable space on the inside, or if he's insulating for the purpose of an air ceiling to make the whole house uh, more comfortable, in which case you can insulate the the floor joist above and then leave the basement as the basement a crawl space or you know as a, un, a a less used space or unused space yeah this this is this is a, a thing a lot of people run into in these older homes and it, there's no one easy straightforward answer you can apply to everything if you want to insulate i would do what steve basic and joe steebrook said for starters you know i mean they're they know more about this than all of us put together and have seen the results of their work right they're scientists they they look at what works and what doesn't i i you know worry that i'm going to get the reputation as you know uh not wanting to help people improve the performance of their homes but uh sometimes you know you you make things worse uh unintentionally when you change the vapor characteristics of older homes. Well, it may be worth mentioning just for the listeners who aren't familiar with the uh, approach to insulating an air sealing, the inside of a foundation that Joe and, and, and Steve have written in articles, Joe in Building Science Corporation and Steve for Fine Home Building, is they, in, in some cases, they put a membrane of some sort, could be a peel and stick material, it could just be a sheet of, of vapor impermeable material, like a plastic sort of stuff, and then spray foam against that. Um, the other way, and Joe, and I know Joe talks about article that referenced in Doug's uh, question, is Joe's discovered that you can just spray foam with the high density spray foam directly against the stone, don't worry about repointing. Don't worry about the surface being dirty. In fact, he, he kind of said, if you leave it dirty and you don't clean it, then the spray foam won't adhere perfectly. And it allows for any moisture that's moving from the outside to the inside, the back spray foam, and then kind of percolate down. The important thing with any of this is that you have some sort of a collection area down at the bottom, a drainage channel inside the foundation to collect any bulk water that's draining down on the inside of either that membrane or the foam. And that way it can be shuttled over to either a sump pump or to daylight through a sub slab drainage system. So there's a lot of detail in the approaches that you need to attend to. It's not just spray foam the outside and you're all done. It's you spray foam in the inside of the foundation, then you're, you're dealing with insulation and uh, moisture vapor transmission through the, the slab area as well. Yeah, I think people get in trouble when they, uh, you know, it's not just insulating, it's managing moisture, right? This is, it's, they, these things have to go together. We're starting to understand that more in the world of building science, I would say. It's one of the things that used to be kind of glossed over, I would say. You know, in the in the 80s and 90s, we were telling people to like dense pack their uh, balloon frame walls, right? And then everyone was like, oh, why is all the paint peeling off? <laughs> well, whatever you do, don't read the article that I wrote in Fine Home Building in uh, like 96 <laughs> or 97 about putting fiberglass insulation on the inside of your studs inside of a foundation wall. You know, there's... Yeah, it's More the, to knowledge it, right? is, the knowledge is we've all raised the, the knowledge bar. Uh, this comes from a repeat customer, Brian. Hey, Patrick, Brian again. I had the question about footing drains feeding into a municipal sewer that Guy Divertis answered a few months ago. Hope all is well. I had another question for the show. I have a 56 cape and my basement laundry room, slot sink and washer was originally connected to my cast iron main stack with a one and a half inch fitting. I have since replumbed the rest of the room's drain waste vent lines with two inch PVC, but used a reducer at the end to fit in the existing one and a half inch. I did this with plans to cut out the section of the old stack to insert the PVC when I had more time. And now I have more time and I'm getting started on this. Will PVC support a cast iron stack vertically? I have what I believe I need for the work, a carbide 
a recip saw, shielded couplings, and the necessary PVC fittings. But I have a question about supporting this. The section has to be replaced as vertical, so the weight of the cast iron stack rests on what is obviously is, is very heavy. It is currently supported with clamps at various points from the basement to the attic, but I'm worried about whether the PVC with fittings will offer the same amount of support. Should I plan to add support to remove any weight off this point, or do I really need to replace it with cast iron in a situation like this? Here are the fittings I'm planning to use if this makes a difference or if you would recommend something else. I'll put the link to his fittings from supplyhouse.com on the podcast page. Um, what do you guys think? Will cast iron support a new branch T uh, for a laundry sink with a two-inch T? I would imagine you run into this quite a bit, Ian, in the remodels that you guys do with the cast old cast iron pipes. Yeah. They're light, right, Ian? Very. Yeah. Uh, oftentimes we're just adding branches to them. We're not actually replacing the stack that's going under the basement floor. But when, when we do get into that replacing parts of the stack, we tend to replace as much of it as we can get after uh, without opening more areas of the house up. So it's not uncommon for us to have a, a couple inches of cast iron stack sticking down from the uh, from the floor above that then is attached to new PVC work. But I think it is important to do some kind of support for it, uh, some kind of clamp. There's a lot of different applications of clamps from the commercial plumbing industry that work really well for that. I think it's code to have to support that every so often, right? It's at every level, as I recall. Am I right? Yeah. So ideally, if the cast iron was installed in the house when the house was being built, and this this is different because you get into some really old houses where they put the plumbing in later and it was, you know, they kind of made it work. But if it was installed when the house was built, ideally they have what are called riser clamps at each floor level. And they're just like these... uh, straps that you bolt two straps together and it has a, an indent to go around the um, a form to go around the pipe and it clamps around the pipe and that will sit on the floor joist. So if there's one of those um, on each level, then that would support any of the pipe above. So I've done jobs where we've actually cut off at the basement level right at the you know, right at the bottom of the floor joist and all the cast iron above there is all supported by those riser clamps. So we can add the PVC without any problem. Theoretically, you wouldn't even want the PVC at the lower level to be supporting all of the, excuse me, the cast iron at the lower level to be supporting all the cast iron above, especially if there ends up being an elbow to go out instead of through, straight down through the, the slab, but out horizontally. Because so, it's going to be pushing into that elbow, stressing it, right? Exactly. That's the problem. And, yeah. and cast iron is not, is not, people think cast iron is this really strong stuff because it's iron. It's not. It's very brittle. It can't support its own weight, except when it's in perfectly vertical uh, suspension. Horizontally, we have to put um, supports, you know, every, whatever, three, four feet when we're installing that, just like PVC. So... I would look if, if um, what was the listener's name? Is it Steve or oh, Brian? Yeah. If I was Brian, I would check and see if there are riser clamps at the floor level above where you're going to make a cut. And if there are, check to make sure that it's still clamping real well. And in that case, I think you can add the PVC without any additional support. I've heard them call it friction bands. Maybe that's a regional term or maybe who I was talking to about it didn't know what they were really called. But uh, as Mike described, it's like, a half a circle with two steel straight ends and you put the two together and it makes what looks like motorheads would call a drive shaft loop, which is, uh, you know, uh, clamped around the pipe and keeps the pipe from coming through the holes in the floor. If, if you don't have these and you cut into this waistline, you're going to know it in a very dramatic fashion is my guess. (laughs) What do you think about his idea to cut that with a carbide, uh, sawzall blade you know i would say get the freud diablo made for cast iron i forget what the per- particular iteration is i know it has uh it has carbide teeth and they work amazing you can do it with a bimetal blade but you'll probably go through a four or five uh at least i have when i've done this in the past it just and you have to up. be very careful with the vibration that you're gonna create with that tool 
as, as Mike put it, you don't know if there's any uh, clamps or proper bracing above you. Um, I've seen people use a grinder too with, uh, yep. you know, an abrasive wheel, but the problem with that is you can't get all the way around the pipe most times, right? Um, what do you do when you're up against the wall, Mike, when you're using a grinder? I luckily haven't encountered that yet. Yeah. What I've been told is you make a hole much bigger on the front side that then you can get the grinder yep. in the pipe. And uh, I thought that was pretty clever. Yeah. Yep. You can do it a lot faster with a grinder. So if you have to cut that bigger hole in the front to get the, the head of your four inch grinder in there, it's not that much more additional work. I would try that Diablo reset blade though, because they, they're amazing. I've, I've used them at trade shows and I, I was really, really impressed with how quickly they cut cast iron and hard steel. It's cool stuff. I've, I've cut cast iron tubs apart with them so we could get them downstairs to, to get them out of the house. Uh, I wish I had those when I was a uh, younger uh, remodeler, right? It's that's a huge innovation. Uh, this comes from Tom. Hey, pod people. Second question about our basement fireplace install. It seems like it would be best to put some foam insulation behind the fireplace against the basement wall. The space will be boxed in with an inlet and outlet and a blower to help circulate the hot air. I'm thinking the concrete wall will act as a huge heat sink. Can you recommend any insulation board for high heat environments? The basement is poured concrete and it's nine and a half feet tall. Thanks, Tom. Uh, Tom, you may remember, is the gentleman who wrote in asking about how to put an eight inch hole in his concrete foundation. <laughs> and uh, did you hear this conversation, Ian? Were you part of it? I was I was on this one. Were I you was on that you. one, Mike? No. Um, so, uh, he wanted to, um, make his own eight inch hole in a concrete foundation. And I think what we told him is figure out something else to, uh, spend your time doing and pay someone to do this. Who's got the gear, right? Have you ever had to do this? I have. I, in fact, last uh, about, yeah, about a year ago, I had to cut, not as I had to cut a, like a four inch hole through a foundation wall to run a well line through. And uh, I ended up doing it the hard way. <laughs> How did you do it? Did you chain zero or did you rent a, a core bit? I didn't. I took uh, my regular um, uh, rotary hammer with a one inch bit and I just drilled like four holes. And then I switched to a chisel and I just brought, you know, from both sides. I, I had access from both sides. So it wasn't terribly hard. It took me about 45 minutes or an hour. But That's it was, not too bad. No, it's not too bad. But I would eight, eight, eight inch hole. Yeah, that that would just be very time consuming. I don't think they'll rent civilians the gear to do that with any efficiency, <laughs> right? <laughs> I wonder what you one of those in. diamond. I wonder what one of those an eight inch diamond uh, core bit would cost. <laughs> it's got to be hundreds minimum, right? Oh, probably. Yeah. I think you'd have to walk into your industrial supply house with loads of self-confidence and uh, <laughs> some, some dirty work clothes on and make sure you park whatever little car you're driving far away from the windows. Hive is vest, but not a like yep. really tidy one, right? It can't be brand yeah. new. Run it over a few times in the dirt. Yeah. Yep. Uh, Does he have so, any option other than mineral wool board? I guess that that's what I want to know. Oh, I forgot about the question. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's the 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 big the, the ones that came to my mind are going to be a rock wool or slag wool. Yep. It, 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 not fiberglass, not fiberglass, but it's going to need to be a rock or slag wool. They, those those insulations can handle up to about two thousand degrees Fahrenheit. So I think this is a completely academic discussion. You have to go to the fireplace manufacturers' instructions and ask them. Right? It, this like we can't even. This is not our. Uh, this is nothing we can answer. Is behind my the fireplace. Answer. I, I guess it depends on where behind the fireplace. You're right, though. You're you're absolutely right. If if this is the cavity within the the fireplace, then yeah, that's up to the manufacturer. But if it's outside of that distance, right. and he wants to insulate to the wall, then then there are options that that, that would be a post manufacturer. Right. My my reading of it was that he's already going to have the required airspace behind the unit, and what can he then put after that airspace? 
Doesn't like putting insulation though, like uh, affect all the clearances? I mean, cause obviously it's gonna be uh, more energy uh, in the firebox or in the area of the enclosure, right? If you if you insulate that. I mean, and, and these this is gas he's talking about. So my guess is that it's uh, built uh, to have, you know, zero or one or two inch uh, clearance to combustibles on the backside, but I don't really know. I, I think the only- I, I guess how, answer is how is that? How is that any different than putting that in a, a first or second floor wood framed wall with your insulation of choice in it? I guess it's not, but it seems different to me because like it's concrete and, um, you know, a wood frame wall uh, is going to give heat up to the other side, you know, the well, we exterior. Don't, we, right? we don't even know. It says our basement fireplace install. We don't know that it's a concrete wall. It could be a walkout basement too. So it could be a wood frame wall. I think we need more details. <laughs> um, it's poured I, concrete, he says. So oh, we does, do know that. Yeah. That. It's at the very and from the, the previous, bottom. the previous concrete question wall, okay. of drilling the hole. Yeah. Uh, Thinking the concrete wall. Yeah. Okay. Do you think he's overthinking it, Patrick? I think you just got to ask the manufacturer, uh, either, you know, consult the manual, the installation manual or call them up because mm -hmm. they deal with this every day and, uh, you got to get this right. This is life safety. You can't Very start good. a fire in your basement. You guys are nodding. Yep. Right. You're, it's a good point. You bring it up because I, I just went straight for the solution. I didn't think about the implications. If you start, messing with anything that a manufacturer's installation instructions, you might uh, inadvertently not follow them, especially when there's fire in a box. I wish I could reach my current fine home building, which is somewhere around my office, but it's a Glenn Matthews in peace and know the code that says manufacturer's instructions trump all, even when you have uh, you know a code versus manufacturer's instructions uh, question, it's always the manufacturer's instructions that are correct in the eyes of the code. And I think that's right because they test these products or know how they're tested. And if you go outside of that, you're taking a risk. Right, Jeff? I think you have to you have to be a little bit careful though that when you finally get a hold of your manufacturer for that, they may not tell you anything other than reciting back the uh what's in the instructions to you. So <laughs> if, if it is as Mike and and I are thinking if he already is going to have that space uh, that it is required by the manufacturer between where his insulation would go, they may offer you zero help because it's outside of, of what their uh, specifications are. You've complained about this many times, Mike. Do you want to talk about the issue we're dealing with here? The issue of where- Bad instructions. <laughs> oh, well, th that's a whole other thing. I don't think that gets to, to Ian's Ian's point is follow the instructions. When you talk to the manufacturer, if something is outside the scope of the instructions, the manufacturers, they're, they, they, you know, it's a connection between a roof and a wall. The roofing manufacturer isn't going to tell you how to deal with the siding inter interface and vice versa. Um, exactly. Yeah. What do you think, Jeff? It, no, I, I definitely think that, you know, it's like you got to follow the, the instructions. And once you're outside that, you know, it's like you can probably do whatever you want, but I think you know, <laughs> as long as you're, do. yeah, as long as you stay within, you know, meet their parameters, and then outside of that, you can kind of do your own thing. But I definitely so, think mineral walls. But with the fireplace, you you may find that you're going to make a change that then requires you to use a different part of their instructions. Like if you're going to put something that is more flammable than drywall or the uh, wall finish covering that they're assuming you're going to have, you may then need six or eight inches uh, of space behind that fireplace. You don't know what that is going to change as far as their instructions. And that would be something that a, a manufacturer would be helpful in in helping you work through, you could tell them what you plan on putting on the wall, and then they should be able to tell you where to look in the instructions to get the right distance. I've had very good success when talking with manufacturers in things that are different, unusual situations that aren't within their, the usual 
scope of how that product gets installed. And they're pretty good at giving advice. Now, I haven't always gotten them to put it in writing for me, but at least to say, you know, look, here's, you know, and they kind of, you know, uh, hedge their through. bets. <laughs> well, they hedge their bets, but they're, they have more information that we have about their products. Mm. And they're able to add that little bit of insight into what you're doing from their perspective. They say, well, here is maybe some things you want to think about that are concerns with our product that aren't really described in the instructions or something like that. But they've been pretty good at, at responding. I had a wonderful experience uh, interviewing Spencer Pope, who is uh, the guy who answers the phone at Bradford White about water heaters, uh, both homeowners and installers and plumbers. And uh, uh, I can imagine him being very forthcoming about how to use their products effectively. Uh, one of the best parts of talking to him was hearing about the wacky things people have called into the line about. Um, my neighbor's kid, uh, filled the direct vent water heater flue with a hose. Uh, <laughs> uh, another one was like filled with gravel uh, that some kid had painstakingly uh, put in that uh, flue pipe. <laughs> of course, it didn't work, right? <laughs> <It's just> like, <laughs> can't imagine what kids are going to do. This is why you need to bring them to touch a trade so they get to get their this out of their system, right? So they don't fill your flue pipe with gravel. Well, you're giving me ideas for some activities we should have in next year. So I'll have a couple of flue pipes there and some gravel and just have the kids fill it up. <laughs> if you do this, you get to make a no heat or no hot water call as a plumber. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and list the neighbor kids to di disable the direct vent water heaters, right? For service calls. You knew I was going to go there with that, that it was probably the, the child of a plumber who wanted that little bit more money for Christmas. New Xbox game, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, um, but we got a couple minutes left. I wanted to ask uh, all of you what the uh, uh, upcoming projects are and then remind folks that stay tuned for the after show. We're going to talk about uh, fall cleanup and fall preparation. So stay tuned for that. So uh, Ian, what's next on your home building? So I have to finally finish my garage drywall and insulation project. I actually have one of the guys from work, uh, one of our young carpenters is going to come out on uh, Saturday tomorrow morning and help me finish that up and I'll rent the blower one more time and uh, finally get rid of that pallet of cellulose that my dad's been moving around the hay barn for way too long. <laughs> Uh, and then that goes the in the tour. garage ceiling. Am, am yeah, I correct? In the garage yeah. ceiling. Yeah. Uh, I, I didn't really want to try and task Sarah or my dad or her dad, Bob, with running the blower again. I figured they're all still uh, not too happy with me from when we built the house and I made them run the blower. Uh, so how I, long did it take to for them to do that work to load your insulation? I, blower? I, we were we were insulating for weeks it felt like and uh it, none of them ever got through a blower session without breaking it or dropping something into it or losing their hat into the blower it just it, yeah does it I, does it insulate with hats no i got really good at taking the Crendel 425 apart and then servicing the parts in the field uh, th thanks to them but uh, I'll get Andy from from work to to run it, and then uh, our shed material should be here in in about two weeks. Oh, so, you can start it in the winter. Wow. Yeah, we're gonna. That'll be my Thanksgiving weekend project, most likely. It's the way it's teeing up. Because you couldn't find a colder time of year to frame a, an outbuilding. Correct. <laughs> I mean, I've, I've told you that the my dad and I roofed the. The farmhouse did a tear off of two layers of asphalt and one layer of uh, cedar shingles. And we did one uh, half of the house on the 4th of July and the other half of the house on Christmas break. So <laughs> hottest day of the year, one side, coldest day of the year, the other. Well, I admire your tenacity. That is some good stuff there. How about you, Mike? What do you got coming up next? Um, nothing other than, uh, the rental properties, which we'll talk about in the after show, but, uh, project wise, I've got the, the deck expos coming up. So I'm going to be heading out to Las Vegas 
I think it's like the 15th to the 17th of November. Um, and it's uh, partnered with the pool and spa and patio show, uh, which is kind of an odd mix, but, but aside the deck builders show up for the deck expo and I'll be doing trainings there. So I'm kind of got my nose into paperwork, figuring out what I got to build ahead of time for those demonstrations. Have the rules changed uh, in recent memory, Mike? The rules regarding deck building? Yeah, sorry. Um, uh, well, there was a 2021 International Residential Code, which though it's you know a, a solid year and a few months old uh, now, a year and a half old, most jurisdictions haven't around the US have not adopted it yet. So for a lot of deck builders, because they're working on the 2015 or the 18 code as the model code enforced there, there are a lot of changes in the 21 code. So um, I go through a lot of those sorts of things to hmm. bring everybody up to speed. So go to Is there a change that relates to using wood decking? I've seen some stuff that Glenn has put out on Instagram about uh, issues regarding like Ipe decking and some other exotic wood decking, but I haven't dug too far into it yet to to really understand it. No, that's, that's news to me. I haven't heard any. There's nothing in the code specifically about uh, using uh, naturally durable materials that that I know of that would preclude the use of those um, uh, hardwood, uh, tropical hardwoods or anything. Mm. The only thing I do know that was a change, and it was, I don't know if it was a 21 or the 18 code, was the number of joists that a wood deck board has to span. Um, you, you know, if you go over two bearing points uh, where there's one in the middle, you actually get this action reaction of the board over a joist. But if you only have two joists and your board is only spanning, say, 16 or, or 24 inches, the span actually gets reduced for that board because it doesn't have that uh, reaction on the opposite side of the bearing point. So it, there are those considerations, but that's and strictly I, about. I think they reduced the span tables. Am I right? Didn't they lower the allowable joist lengths for the joist spans? Uh, yeah. it's it's they ha they always reduce the span length every time they have a code change, whether it's the floor framing for a deck or whether it's a floor framing for the interior of a house. Um, and that's because they, they, you know, review the wood coming out of mills from around the, the North America and they just see what quality and what it can handle. Um, and they're <laughs> always doing testing at the American, I think the American Wood Council does that. Um, so yeah, the wood properties do change with the, the uh, age of wood. And now that we're having third and fourth fourth growth lumber as opposed to old growth lumber the spans have come down and down and down well folks unfortunately that's all the time we have for today i'm going to ask you to stick around for the uh, members only after show and if you are a fine home building member uh, all access member thank you so much for your support and it helps us keep the lights on stay tuned for your podcast uh you guys have anything to add all right thanks very much for listening see you folks in a little bit <laughs>